Well, tonight we're going to try again to do this message, um, to marry the king, part two. Now, I tried to do that about two weeks ago. We had a good crowd here, and we ended up doing ministry all night, which was just excellent. So I was thrilled with that. Part one, we did the first of the month uh, on Pentecost, because I believe Pentecost is going to be our wedding day. I believe that uh, as we go into the wedding season, and everybody wants to be the, the June bride. It's such an exciting time. But I think that's coming from the Spirit because I believe that we are going to be spring brides. Because I believe that Pentecost will be our wedding day. And I think that it's important that we uh, think and consider about what's going to be coming in our future. Because I, I've realized that not everybody has the same expectations about what their salvation is all about. You know, we all have different testimonies and experiences, and uh, many were probably saved uh, because their parents were saved, and they got in their family, and they said, that's what we do. We get saved, and we're Christians. Maybe some of you were saved because uh, someone told you that, you know, you go to hell if you don't get saved. So, okay, well, I'm going to get saved, so I don't have to go to hell. And maybe some were saved because they said, hey, eternal life. I want eternal life. I want to, I want to keep my life going, so um, I want to pray the prayer so that I can have eternal life. And there's some here that have just had very difficult situations, and the reason you got saved was you came to the end of your rope, and you needed a Savior. And God came and reached and grabbed you. And some of you may be there every day, for all I know, that you need the Lord to pull you out each day, but... There's a little bit of a problem here, and that's that that's just the salvation part of the kingdom. Now, O.J. delivered a message uh, last night about that, and he said, you know, if you were out there drowning and somebody came by and saved you, that person is your savior. And you are very grateful that they have saved your life. But it doesn't make them your Lord. And there's a question of what your expectation is of the kingdom. And that's what I believe is different here. That I believe the ministers here have a heart that they have an expectation in this kingdom. And what is that expectation? I believe it's to marry the king. Because that is a different goal. It's a different goal than saying, hey, I don't want to go to hell. Or, hey, I want to have eternal life. Or, I just want to get through the next day. Because it sets an expectation of the kingdom. Because I know that there's lots of Gospels out there to get you saved. But that doesn't make Him your Lord. You have to choose Him as your Lord. So there's a whole different picture here that we need to look at and set an expectation for. Because there's many churches that seem like the end point is salvation. But I believe that that is the beginning point and not the end point. And I believe that we have a wedding coming. And my goal is I want to be... I want to be the bride. And I know they say there's no male or female, Jew or Greek in heaven. But there actually is male and female in heaven. He is the male and we're all female. There is a wedding. There is a marriage. That's what this is all about. The Bible started with a wedding and a marriage. And it's going to end when one. Because this is the purpose that I feel at least that I was called to. And what I want to share tonight is I think that there's a higher calling, and I think that many of you are seeking that. But don't think that just because you prayed the prayer of salvation, that all of a sudden you're going to be the bride, because I don't think the Bible supports that. I know that's what you think. You say, well, I've said the prayer. But he may not even be your Lord, more or less your husband. So let's look into that a little bit. Because I do not believe that the scripture says that everyone who's saved is necessarily going to be the bride. As a matter of fact, he said that there were ten virgins in Matthew 25. And out of the ten, these were people waiting for their Savior. These were people actually preparing to be the bride. And only five of them even got the preparations right and made it in. But there's so many more that don't even have an expectation that they want to be the bride. They're just looking to get in the kingdom. But I don't believe the kingdom is made up of one king and everybody else is the queen. I just don't think that's what the kingdom looks like. 
I think that there's going to be a king, and there's going to be a queen, there's going to be a government, and there's going to be a kingdom. And I want to be the bride. Because that's not about just my position, it's about him. And I think that that's what, that's what he's put on my heart. And that's why I think this message to me is so important. What is your expectations? What, what do you want to go for? Because if it's just salvation, you probably already got that. But there's more. Because in the entire Bible, if you look at the New Testament, how much of it's written to the unsaved in the New Testament? Did Paul write letters to the unsaved? He wrote letters to seven churches, didn't he? What about Jesus? Did he write letters to the unsaved? No, he wrote letters to seven churches. Well, let's look at that. By the way, the key scripture is Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has what? Made herself ready. We're not all going to be able to make ourselves ready. Ready for what? Ready to marry the king. So let's look at some of the scriptures here. Revelation 3, it's out of one of the letters, and we t covered this in the first part of the message. It says, To him who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on my throne. So who is it that sits on the throne with the king? The queen. So, it's, but is everybody going to be this? No, it's to he who overcomes. And this was written to the churches. So, what's the question that you need to ask? How about overcome what? Right? If this is important to you, then you need to figure out what it is that you need to overcome. So, if we go back about five verses, or ten pages, there we go, five verses... We'll see Revelation 3, 15 through 16. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. That's interesting. Now, did he say, um, I know your deeds, that you've been obedient and disobedient, or you've been good and bad, you've been right or wrong? Is that what he said? What terms did he use? Hot and cold. What do you use those terms for? You use them in a relationship. He's talking about the passion in your heart here. He's not talking about were you obedient? Did you stay between the lines? Did you obey the law? He said, no, are you hot or are you cold? He's talking about a relationship here. I wish that you were one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. No, I don't think everybody's going to be the bride. Now. I'm not going into once saved, always saved, because for all I know, you could be spewed out of his mouth and still be saved and in the kingdom. There's lots of places in the kingdom. But whatever it is, the position was you were once in him, and now you've been expelled out of him. That can't be good. <laughs> and it, apparently, are we hot toward him? Do you see, that's a relationship. So it's very important as to what you're in this thing for. And oh, by the way, this isn't just in Revelation. Let's go back and take John 15. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. You want to do a study sometime, do a study on the word abides. It doesn't mean every now and then I visit there. Abide means that that's your home. That's where you live. That's where you exist. He says, He who abides in me and I in him. You see, we're talking about salvation. And when we talk about salvation, we're talking about getting him in us, right? You pray the prayer and the Holy Spirit comes and he now, you now have him in you. But that's not all he said, did he? He said, yes, I in you, but also you in me. You must be attached to me. You must make your choice. Are you plugged into him? Are you a part of his body? Are you submerged in his spirit? So, yes, you can have him in you, but maybe you're not in him. And he says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, apparently you were attached at one point, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. Once again, 
Is it once saved, always saved? I don't know. But what he's saying is if you choose not to abide in him, there's a, a severing that takes place of that branch, and that branch dries up. So let's continue on and take a look. We talked about Pentecost because I believe it's our wedding day because I believe that there's patterns in the, in the Bible with the feasts. And there are three basic harvests, he said, that we're to have feasts over and to keep these things. One of them is unleavened bread or Passover. The second one is Pentecost. And then the last one is the festival of the ingathering or tabernacles. Notice in Pentecost, he says, celebrating the first fruits of your work in the planting the field. So this is a, a, a situation where there's a harvest, but there's also a planting. And then notice in the fall, it says the festival of the ingathering at the end of the year when you gather the fruit of your work. So there's three harvests here, and I believe that represents uh, us being joined with him into the kingdom. So what do you see the three as? Well, the first one, of course, was Christ, right? In Passover, he was the first fruits. He fulfilled the first fruits festival. Plus, it may also be the Old Testament saints may be first fruits. So there is, if you will, there's a gathering together with him and a change and transformation into the kingdom there. The second one is Pentecost. And then the third one is at the end of the year, the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles. Well, I'm saying that I want to be a part of the wheat harvest, not the harvest at the end, at the end of the year. Because I believe those are both harvests, and I believe they're things to be celebrated. So that's what I've been talking about, the patterns. So I see two patterns here. One I'll call the spring pattern, and the other I'll call the fall pattern. Now, in the spring pattern, we've seen it many times because we've seen it at least twice so far, right? The spring pattern happened in Egypt, and then Christ followed that pattern. I believe there'll be a third fulfillment of that pattern. And then there's a final pattern. And I believe that that's another harvest, but it's the grapes of wrath. It's a, there's a judgment harvest that will come at the end. I want to be a part of the spring harvest. I want to be a part of the wheat harvest, not a part of the grapes of wrath harvest. Because I believe they're different. Notice what he said here in Luke 22. He said, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So this, this was obviously right before the next day, the day, next, the day before Passover, when he was going to be crucified. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So you think he was talking about tomorrow, the next day? No, I, I don't think so. I think he's talking about another fulfillment that's going to come when he returns for his bride. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. So I believe he's, this is a picture of what's going to happen when he brings us up for, this, for the wedding. And I believe it's going to take place in this pattern. So let's look at that pattern. Now, I covered this in the last message where I've, I've taken the, the pattern and I've laid it out with Israel in Egypt, with the church, with Jesus, and with the bride. And if you'll see, there's a, there's a common pattern between the three. Now, I'm not going to go through it all for the sake of time because I did in the, in the last lesson. But let me just take the ones there with the red. Where we noticed on Israel... Wrath was poured out on Egypt, and he, through the Passover, they passed over the, the, the children of Israel, and they were delivered out of Egypt. Then we look, so there was a wrath, a pouring out of his wrath there. And there was a pouring out of his wrath uh, when Jesus came, but the wrath was poured out on him, because now we're, instead of being set free from Egypt, we're being set free from sin through the mark of the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross. Well, I believe that we're also going to be delivered from the turmoils of this world. And He's going to come and get us. And He's going to deliver His bride from the wrath of the world 
through the marks of the Holy Spirit through the rapture. So I believe that the rapture is probably going to happen on a Passover. Because that was when I called my son out of Egypt. I've called my children out of Egypt. And I think he's going to come for us. If we follow it on through to the end here, we'll see at Shavuot or, Shavuot or Pentecost. In Shavuot, it's, they met with God on Mount Sinai. And they actually said that it was a marriage contract between God and Israel. And they became the nation of God. They were transformed into this nation. And then on Pentecost, which of course is the same holiday, the Spirit was giving and we became the church of Jesus Christ. So we were also transformed as another picture. And then I believe though it will also be our wedding day. Just as God was married uh, back at Mount Sinai and we were betrothed in Pentecost, I believe that we will actually have a wedding day, and it will be on Pentecost or Shavuot. So I believe that there's a spring pattern here that we want to be a part of. Now, I talked, this is also from the last time, and I'll just briefly cover this. We know that when Jesus died at Passover that the veil was rent. And we talked about how the, that's the significance of that between the Old Covenant Temple and the New Covenant Temple, right? The Old Covenant Temple was a model of a, of a body. And we, of course, are that New Covenant Temple. So if we looked, we, we looked and saw that there was a veil between the Holy of Holies, which was represented God's Spirit and where the law was kept, and where the priests were, where man was. So in the model, of course, that also relates to body, soul, and spirit. And, of course, there was a barrier between the spirit and the soul. So this was the, the renting of that. And that renting of a barrier is the equivalent of a man and a woman coming together and being as one. And there is a, there's a veil that's rent. And we saw that through that now the spirit could come and dwell within man. Now, I looked at Jeremiah, and Jeremiah explains it this way. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. So we know that salvation is when we have the living law put inside of us, right? So the Holy Spirit comes to be what part of us is saved with the Holy Spirit? Our spirit, right? It's transformed, made new. So we see that here, that the picture of the, the Holy Spirit in the Holy of Holies is equivalent to salvation, that our spirit now becomes holy. But then, since the veil is rent, we can go through another process. He said, I will put my laws in their minds. I believe that's a salvation. But I will write it on their hearts. I believe that that can be a picture of sanctification. So it's here. But have you let it into you? Have you invited it in? Has the two become one? And I think that's what we're talking about here. And I think something special is going to happen in our wedding day. And I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I believe however that is consummated, however we are joined together, I don't know what kind of creation it will be, but it will be something special. But I believe this is a picture here of how we literally, you could say, well, one is maybe uh, Passover may represent salvation. And maybe Pentecost, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, may be sanctification. But somehow we're to yield to that spirit and it's going to come in and change us. Now, I believe that's the process that we need to go through to be prepared for the bride. And I have a message on that that I'm not going to cover, of course, tonight. And it's uh, called sanctification. That I believe that's the process of, of preparing as a bride. If you want to marry the king, you, you're going to have to prepare. And of course you can see my picture there. Uh, you know who that is. And you know that when she was betrothed, she had to go through a process to be prepared to marry the, the king. And therefore, I think that we're going to have to go through a process, and I'm calling it sanctification. What we must do to be ready when he returns. 
So I just want to take a quick look at some prophecies because if it is your heart to marry the king, then you're going to be reading the Bible looking for information about this. You're going to say, I want to understand what you want from me. I want to be the hot. I don't want to be the cold and I don't want to be the lukewarm. Because Lord, I want you in my heart. I want to be there. Because it's you that I'm in this thing for. Not just your kingdom, not just, not just because I don't want to go to hell. Not because I just want to go to heaven. But I want to be with you. And I believe that's what we're here to do. I believe that this group is a group that's pursuing at that level. So I'm going to look at a, a prophecy, and we're just going to do one. We're going to do the Song of Solomon. And let's look at it as another picture of the spring wedding. And I'm going to be using Song of Solomon 2, 10 through 13. Now I hope you'll give me a little freedom here, because I have done some red highlighting. Notice I said it's only for illustration. Now the reason I did this is because I want you to see this as a conversation between Christ and His bride. Because this is an intimate discussion. Now you can't, Solomon probably didn't see Jesus Christ and see Him saying these words. But I think at least the commentaries I took a quick look at all seem to believe that this is about Christ and His bride. So I want to look at this as a picture of this. And I'm going to start by going back and putting a little context, starting with uh, Solomon Solomon 2, 1. Notice I use the red to show when the Lord is speaking and the black when we are speaking. So he says, I'm the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. We recognize that the, Jesus as the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. A lily is a very white, pure flower. And notice he said that his beloved, his darling, is like a lily among the thorns. That we're to be like him among the thorns. He's describing the other maidens as like thorns. So obviously everybody's not going to meet this standard. And then she says, like an apple tree among the trees in the forest. Well, trees, as we know from the Garden of Eden, often represent a picture of the tree of life and the different trees of religion, right? The knowledge of good and evil, the law, represents the different trees of religion. And he says, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, all these different religions, so is my beloved among the young men. In his shade I took great delight and sat down, and in his fruit was... Sweet to my taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He has brought me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. He's taken me into his banquet hall, meaning that in whatever large assembly he's honored in, he takes you in right by his side with a banner over you that says, This is my beloved. Sustain me with raisin cakes, refresh me with apples, because I am lovesick. Let his left hand be under my head, and his right hand embrace me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and the hinds of the field, that you don't arouse or awaken my love until he or she pleases. In other words, she's got an intimate situation with him where she's He's at rest with her. He's, she's dreaming of this and saying, don't disturb me. I'm really getting into, I, this is where I want to be. Listen, my, my beloved, behold, he is coming, climbing on the mountains and leaping on the hills. See, the Lord is returning is what he's saying. My beloved is like a gazelle or young stag. Behold, he is standing behind a wall. He's looking through the window. He's peering through the lattice. He's coming close. He's watching. He's near. That's how close he is. Then we continue on with verse 10. My beloved responded and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. King James Version says, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Away from what? Away from Egypt. Away from sin. Or now, away from this world. Notice he says, Arise. Come up, my darling. 
my beautiful one, and come along. I believe it's a calling. I believe this could be the rapture. For behold, winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers have already appeared in the land, the time has arrived for the pruning of the vines, the voice of the turtle dove has been heard in our land. The fig tree has ripened its figs, and the vines and the blossoms have given forth their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. He says it again. So you can see he's bracketed this with, this, with his call. And inside he's describing the situation. So we're going to take a quick look at that and see if this really fits what we've been talking about. For behold, winter is past, the rain is over and gone. I think what he's saying is that we're going to endure some, some cold and difficult times. But there's going to be an end to that. And he's saying, hey, the, the rain, that which, that which ripens the crop, and by the way, the crop is ripening quickly with the types of rain we're seeing in the world today. He's saying, the, the winter is past, the rain is over, so we're going to go through some things. But he's saying, hey, there's going to be a time. And then he says, the flowers have already appeared in the land. I believe that represents us. I believe that we are that. That a flower, when it appears, is something that comes forth and blossoms into something beautiful and becomes reproductive at that point. I think he's going to say, hey, my church is starting to blossom. It's coming forth. It's, it's, it's showing forth its beauty, its fragrance, and it's becoming reproductive. The time has arrived for the pruning of the vines. Now, that's a more difficult statement. So what's he saying here? Well, you remember we just read John 15? I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. But if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So I believe that if we miss that wheat harvest that was going to come, that at least six months before the final harvest, it could be six months, it could be three years and six months, but I believe that there's going to be a harvest at the end, but I want to be in the early harvest. I don't want to be in this. I, there'll be people saved in the last harvest. But I believe the wedding will have taken place. And you see, the wedding's only going to occur one time. I don't know about you, but I don't believe Jesus is going to get married multiple times. And I don't believe the bride is going to change. I think once it happens, that's it for eternity. I don't think, I don't even believe God's going to have more sons. I think this is, He is a manifestation. And I think that this is the one opportunity. I think all creation is about preparing a bride for His Son. Someone to be by His side, to have and to hold, to love and to cherish for eternity. Someone to rule with Him. It's not an end point, it's a beginning. A man doesn't get married at the end of his life, he gets married at the beginning of his life, so he'll have someone to share it with. So I believe that we're walking through this process down here on earth, even now. And yes, there's some beautiful weddings that take place in June, but the wedding down here is till death do you part. The one up there is for eternity. So he says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch. Matthew says the same thing. Only it's called the harvesting of the wheat. Remember, Pentecost is the wheat harvest. That's what it is. And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, this is sowing the tares into the field. Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no. For while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot some of the wheat with them. So allow both to grow together until the harvest. So you say, well, Lord, why aren't you getting rid of some of these things in your body? He said, no. He's describing it right here. When it comes time for the wheat harvest, yes, there's tares in the field. But he says, I'm letting them grow up together. He says, allow both to grow together until the harvest. When is the wheat harvest? It's Pentecost. 
And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them and gather my wheat into the barn. There's a picture. We are the wheat that should be gathered into the barn. So can you, can you see the pattern here of what he's saying? And the voice of the turtle dove has been heard in our land. Well, if you take the word turtle off there, which is a description, all it really is, is the, the voice of the dove has been heard in our land. So I believe when it's time for us to leave, it'll be after the voice of the Holy Spirit is heard across the land. Acts 2. Now this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. See, the voice of the dove will be heard through the prophecies of everyone because he's pouring out his spirit that all may hear. He wants everyone to have a chance to know. Matthew 24. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Now, it doesn't say all nations are going to be saved. When you say a testimony, it may be not, that may not be for the defense. That may be a testimony for the prosecution. As a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So I believe it's, another, it's a picture also of the Spirit and the prophecy we're going to see in the last days. The fig tree has ripened its figs. Well, this is a little tougher one. But notice that the fig tree is a sign. As a matter of fact, he says it right here in Matthew 24. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you will know that summer is near. Is that a picture? So you too, when you see all of these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. I believe that he's talking about this summer harvest, this spring harvest. And he's using the fig tree as an example here. Notice that NIV says it a little bit different. Instead of the fig tree has ripened its figs, it says the fig tree forms its early fruit. And why that's important is, you know, I told you I believe there's two patterns of harvest. Well, as it turns out, the fig tree actually has two crops per season. It has a spring crop and it has a fall crop. There's the early figs and there's the late figs. The early figs are harvested in late spring, which is about the time of the wheat harvest. The late figs are harvested all the way into the fall, in the fall harvest. So can you see that there's, whatever this is, these figs, whatever represents the religion or the church, that there is those who are going to be the early figs and then there's going to be the late figs. Remember he said the early figs have ripened on the rapture that we're talking about here in Song of Solomon. If we look at the late figs, you'll notice in Revelation 6, 12, uh, 12, 13, 17, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat's hair, and the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. There's your late figs. So which do you want to be, the early fig or the late fig? It's interesting because Jeremiah talked about them also. Jeremiah talked about, in Jeremiah 24, The Lord showed me two baskets of figs placed in front of the temple of the Lord. You see, these figs are, are people who are coming to the temple. We're talking about people who are called themselves believers in God. One basket had good figs like those that ripen early. The other basket has very poor figs, so bad they could not be eaten. 
there's going to be a separation. And I want to be the, one of the early figs. I want to be ripe and ready. If not, I don't want to go through whatever's going through after that. Because it's going to be a very difficult time on the earth after that. Because I believe that's when the wrath comes forth. So the good figs are the early figs and the bad figs are the late figs. Continuing on down Jeremiah 24, he actually describes the two. The good figs. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord and they will be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me with all of their heart. There's your good figs. The bad figs in Jeremiah 24.9 don't fare as well. Notice the, the, the way that Jeremiah 24-7, talking about the good figs, looks a whole lot like the prayer of salvation. The word, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. He's talking about the heart here. That's more than just salvation. The word of faith which we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. But I want more than that. I want more than that. And I'm hoping you do too. And finally, the vines in blossom have given forth their fragrance. So what does that, you think that means? Well, there's a couple of things I see. One is this scripture that Paul said. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph, triumphal possession or procession in Christ. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. So we're to spread that fragrance. But there's also another picture of this fragrance. Lord, I call to you, come quickly to me. Hear my voice, I call to you. May my prayers be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Yes, prayer is an incense before God. He said the, end, this, the aroma of this is being spread. That means that prayers are coming up before him. If you look at it back to our model, you'll notice that the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, the altar of incense is right outside of the veil. And if you look at it as a person, that basically shows that would be right underneath the nostril. That the incense is coming up. It looks like this. That your soul and your prayers are an incense to the Spirit. Revelation 5. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, and each one had a harp. And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So apparently there's going to be a major prayer revival about the time of his return. So that's the picture that I see in the Song of Solomon. I believe it says that we're going to have a spring wedding. And this is what I'm in it for. This is what I'm hoping you're in it for. Because that's what I want to gather around the people who have a heart to be the bride. I don't want to miss that. That's what's important to me. Yes, I love the fact that I'm saved. I love the fact that He is my Lord and Savior. But I also want to be His spouse. I want to be the bride. I don't know how many will be there, but the Lord has a right to pick whoever He wants as His bride. And for all I know, even after, if we are raptured on, on Passover, that doesn't mean everybody that's raptured may not be the bride. Because I believe that there's going to be guests at the wedding supper. And the bride isn't considered a guest. He doesn't need to be invited to the wedding dinner. So I don't know who's going to make it and who's not, but I want to be there. Luke 21 says that. He says, Be careful of your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. 
and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all of those who live in the face of the whole earth. So you must always be on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that's about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Now, who stands before the Son of Man? The bride. He's not talking about judgment here. He's talking about the bride. That we want to escape all of these things and stand before Him. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Lord, I don't know how many people in this room or that may watch this or even in our area that, that have a heart to be the bride, Lord. But Lord, I'm calling them forth because I want to join with them, Father. I want, to, I want to make sure, that, Lord, that we can be with you and spend our life with you, Lord. We love you and we want to be there. Because you're the prize, Lord. You're what we want. And we're looking forward to spending eternity by your side. We look forward to whatever this is going to be. We, we can only imagine. Lord, if we can make weddings such a big thing down here, we can't even imagine what it will be like there. But Lord, we're not in it for the wedding. We're in it for the marriage. We're in it for you. And I ask you, Father, just to touch everybody's heart and reset whatever their expectations are, Father. And if they're ones that, that really have a heart to be the bride, I ask that you guide them and lead them into an understanding of who you are. That we may be hot and not lukewarm or cold. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Flip over to that slide that gave the different places in Scripture um, that we can look up about. Song of Solomon, Fig Tree, Esther. Oh, yes. Yes, these are all what I consider prophecies of the wedding. There we go. Uh, we talked a little bit about the fig tree, but there's a whole lot more there. The wheat and the tares, there's a lot more there. Meeting God on Mount Sinai, if you study that, you'll see what it's like when God shows up in all of His glory. And look at the situation there and how it relates to the preparation in the three days before. Uh, the wedding of Cana is another picture. With the, you'll look, it was on the third day. Uh, but you'll see what the transformation of the water into the wine. The story of Esther and the story of Ruth. As a matter of fact, the story of Ruth, I believe, is actually read during Pentecost. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So these are just some of the prophecies. Anything else? We good? Okay, thank you.